JPEG, TIFF, MP1 through MP4, AVI, MOV, PNG, WAVE. There are numerous file formats, and at times, it can seem like an alphabet soup at the end of a file name. But proper format selection is a significant part of digital preservation. Greetings, I'm Samuel Alexander, Sarlick County Libraries and Histories Librarian Archivist, and in this presentation, I'll provide a very brief introduction as to why it's important to consider the formats you use when working with digital content. Like analog formats, Digital formats store and arrange content in interactive forms. These digital formats can vary in their level of quality and file size. Additionally, various formats are accessed in different ways and can differ in the metadata they offer. Metadata is data about data. For example, a digital photograph may have embedded metadata documenting when the photograph was taken and what camera model was used. Metadata is one of the important terms I'll be referring to in this presentation. Metadata is one of the important terms I'll be referring to in this presentation. Another important term is compression, which is one way file sizes can shrink. Compression can vary in three ways among file formats. The first form of compression is uncompressed, where the file size is unreduced. Although uncompressed formats offer excellent quality, that quality is partnered with large file size. Next, we have lossless compression, where file size shrinks through reversible methods. This can reduce file size while maintaining details, but the size reduction may be underwhelming. Lastly, there's lossy compression, where algorithms are applied to irreversibly reduce file size. This offers the most reduction, but can also lead to generation loss where each successive edit or copying of a file loses data. Another term to keep in mind is data compression ratio, which is employed to describe the efficiency of the compression process. Another characteristic of file formats is whether the format is proprietary or open. A proprietary file format is owned and controlled by a company. These formats can be excellent in specific contexts, but they frequently entail the risk of limited accessibility due to other companies not supporting them or their own companies regarding them as obsolete. Open file formats, on the other hand, are unexclusive to specific software and hardware openly available with their developments and standards operated by an open organization. Before we get any further, I want to state the preservation process begins with the capturing of media. This holds true whether you're taking a photo, recording a conversation, or filming an outing. The camera on my phone outputs JPEGs by default, but these JPEGs are processed and compressed automatically by my phone. 
That's why it's critical to configure your settings to make sure you're procuring the output you want, which may be unprocessed and uncompressed raw files. These raw files may look or sound off when compared to the processed files, as exemplified in this slide, but this difference is important as it allows for more possibilities when editing the data and preserving it. When it comes to what sets the size of files, the exact name of the factors can vary. For images, the three factors are pixel dimensions, bit depth, and file format. Dimensions represent the width by height of the image in terms of pixels. Bit depth represents the number of bits used to indicate the color of a pixel or the color component in a pixel. And file formats can vary depending on the purpose of the image, but in terms of image preservation, the main three formats to keep in mind are TIFF, PNG, and JPEG. TIFF can be either uncompressed or lossless, and is great for when you need high-quality preservation files. Keep in mind, however, that they have remarkably large file sizes. PNG can similarly be uncompressed or lossless, and they were created to replace GIF. PNG is primarily utilized for graphic design and websites, and shouldn't be used for photographs and printing. Lastly, JPEGs are the most popular image format in the world, and they're great for searing and printing. They implement lossy compression, however, so you should try and avoid utilizing it for preservation when possible. Although you can reduce file size by reducing factors like dimensions and bit depth, this can significantly impact the quality of the content in the file. This holds true for audio and video files as well. I've prepared some examples to illustrate the impact reducing dimensions and bit depth can have on images. In this slide, I have halved the dimensions of this image of a frog. On the left is the original, and on the right is the one that has had the dimension halved. Although there may not seem to be a difference aside from an attractive 80% reduction in file size, this isn't the whole truth. Upon closer examination, when you look at the frog in the photograph, a reduced dimension leads to a loss in quality, with details becoming distorted. Having the dimensions in this instance has made the frog cloudier. In this slide, the image on the left has a bit depth of 16, while the one on the right has a bit depth of 8. Again, at first glance, you may not see any differences, aside from the file size being cut in half. Reduced bit depth may not impact an image as much as reduced dimensions do, however. As we can see zoomed in on the frog here, that although the coloring looks smoother with the original bit depth, the coloring with the reduced bit depth isn't too rough or abrupt in comparison, just not as nice looking. As mentioned before, file formats can implement compression to reduce their file size, on this slide, you can see an uncompressed TIFF on the left and a lossless compressed TIFF on the right. The file size change is smaller compared to 
when you reduce dimensions or bit depth, however. Simultaneously, compression can have less of an impact on images themselves. Here you can see there's minimal impact when you're examining the details of the frog up close. That steers us to how different file formats can impact file size and quality. In this example, you're seeing a TIFF on the left compared to a JPEG saved at 100% quality on the right. Once again, it can be challenging to identify the differences at first. When zooming in, the differences on the frog are rather minimal. It should be mentioned that the TIFF on the left possesses a bit depth of 16, while all JPEGs express a bit depth of 8. Consequently, the TIFF does have a more vivid and smooth coloring, similar to how the 16-bit TIFF compared to the 8-bit TIFF, but overall, the change in format provides a greater size reduction than either having the dimension or having the bit depth. For our last example, let's compare a compressed TIFF with halved dimension and half bit depth to a JPEG saved at 50% quality. Again, an initial look doesn't offer explicit differences. Zoomed in, the smaller file size JPEG presents a sharper details on the frog than the TIFF. Therefore, if file size is of the most concern, it's more sensible to use the 50% quality JPEG here than a heavily reduced TIFF. While image files and audio files may target different senses, the intersection of quality, file format, and file size remains, meaning the underlying principles of preservation still apply. In this regard, consider the wave and broadcast wave formats to be like the TIFF format. They're uncompressed or lossless, but offer significantly excellent quality at the cost of high file size. Likewise, MP3s are akin to JPEGs in being compressed and easier to distribute, but not ideal for preservation purposes. With videos, expect large file sizes regardless of format. In terms of which format is ideal for preservation, there's no one standard but audio, video, interleave, and QuickTime file format tend to be agreed upon. Both formats are proprietary, but they're widely supported and therefore escape some of the problems that's usually attached to proprietary formats. In terms of which one you should implement, the choice comes down to what kind of content you're working on. AVI is simpler, but MOV allows for more complexity. Lastly, if you're looking to distribute the video, then MPEG-4 represents the primary choice for distribution. Overall, although I strongly suggest using compressed or lossless formats when possible for preservation, that is not always a viable solution. Therefore, it's crucial to thoroughly consider your options and what you're working with. You may find a lossy format fulfills your needs better than a lossless format with significantly reduced quality. In such a case, however, I recommend maintaining two versions of the lossy file one that you employ as a preservation copy that you do not use for edits or copying, and then a functional copy that you do use for such purposes. 
This concludes our program. If you enjoyed this video, let us know in the comments. Like, subscribe, and tell your friends.